Hello Cardinals and welcome to our first lesson together in distance learning. Today's story we're going to read is Where Have You Gone Charming Billy? It's by Tim O'Brien. Tim O'Brien is known for writing stories about the Vietnam War. His most famous is The Things They Carried. So today's question is, is fear our worst enemy? Your heart pounds, your hands shake, your stomach churns, adrenaline floods your body, you're gripped by fear. And the way you react to it is as unique as your fingerprints. And where have you gone, Charming Billy, a young soldier struggling through the first night in Vietnam, tries desperately to combat his growing terror. There are different kinds of responses to fear. There are positive responses and negative responses. With the positive responses, let's just imagine that a tiger has walked into the room. There are positive ways to respond, uh, ways that will save your life. And there are negative ways to respond ways that will cause you to die much quicker. What I want you to do right now is come up with three positive and three negative reactions to fear and then make some sort of conclusion, some sort of statement about your reaction to fear. What's the purpose of those fear reactions? Why do we behave this way? If you remember, what you're eventually going to be doing with this piece is writing a Thames paragraph about mood. So that's what we're gonna pay attention to. One of the best ways to discern the mood is to look at the author's style. The style is the way that a particular piece is written, not what is said, but how it's said. So the author's style depends on many elements, including his or her choice of words, tone, and sentence structure. Remember, we've talked about word choice before. Does the writer use long sentences packed with details or ones that short to the point? Does he or she describe realistic settings and characters or a world of fantasy? Is the tone dreamy and romantic or down to earth? So we're gonna look at a couple of pieces for um, how an author establishes their style. Um, there is tone, okay? It's the writer's attitude toward a subject. It's expressed through choice of words and details. Some common tones are formal, playful, matter of fact, respectful. Um, sentence structure. Sentences can be long or short, and to the point of making things overly complex, some authors mix long and short sentences. For an example, we have Amy Tan. She uses short sentences, which contribute to her informal style. She writes more like, we talk. What was his name, question mark, Randy, period. You don't remember, question mark? See, very short sentences. Also, authors can use word choice. Uh, we've discussed this. Um, they can use formal words, dramatic words. Um, they might choose words that are more conversational um, or words that are more descriptive. And Where Have You Gone Charming Billy, O'Brien uses a style of realism. If I was going to turn this into a mood word, what would I change it to? Realistic. Right? He writes in a realistic style. So one of the ways that he does that is that he writes in dialogue that sounds natural, like the way we actually speak. If you want a really, really big word for this, it's called vernacular. Vernacular is when you write the way you talk. He uses vivid descriptions of what the soldier sees, and he mixes long and short sentences to communicate their thoughts and their feelings. Where Have You Gone, Charming Billy by Tim O'Brien. Background. This story takes place during the Vietnam War, a war in which over 58,000 Americans died. Rebels backed by the communist ruled North Vietnam tried to take over South Vietnam in 1957. The date's important because it tells you about the time period that the story was written in. 1957 was obviously a very long time ago, so things are going to be a little bit different than what we're used to. The U.S. entered the war as a South Vietnamese ally in 1964. Between 1965 and 1973, over 2 million Americans were sent to Vietnam, including author Tim O'Brien. In 1973, O'Brien published his first book, An Account of His Time in Vietnam. The war has since been the main subject of his writing ever since. 
The platoon of 26 soldiers moved slowly in the dark, single file, not talking. One by one, like sheep in a dream, they passed through the hedgerow, crossed quietly over a meadow, and came down to the rice paddy. If you look at the bottom, a hedgerow is a thick hedge that separates uh, fields and farms, and a rice paddy is a flooded field where rice is grown. Um, flooded should kind of give you an idea that there's fields and farms. This is going to be rural, and you need to understand it's very wet. <laughs> um, there, they had stopped. Their leader knelt down, motioning with his hand, and one by one the other soldiers squatted in the shadows, vanishing in the primitive stealth of warfare. For a long time they did not move, except for the sounds of their quiet breathing. The 26 men were very quiet, some of them excited by the adventure, some of them afraid, some of them exhausted from the long night march, some of them looking forward to reaching the sea where they could be safe. The author uses parallel structure here. What you'll notice is that he starts off every sentence with some of them. What this does is it gives us something to look at to see the relations between the men. So some of them are looking for adventure, some of them are afraid, some are just exhausted, and some of them just want to be safe. At the rear of the column, Private First Class Paul Berlin lay quietly with his forehead resting on a black plastic stock of his rifle, his eyes closed. He was pretending he was not in the war, pretending he had not watched Billy Boy Watkins die of a heart attack that afternoon. He's in war, but he died of a heart attack. That's interesting. He was pretending to be a boy again, camping with his father in the midnight summer along the Des Moines River. In the dark, with his eyes pinched shut, he pretended. Look please over at the uh, make inference question, and it wants to know what does the soldier's silence indicate about the area in which they are patrolling? If they have to be dead quiet, what does that mean about where they are? He pretended that when he opened his eyes, his father would be there by the campfire and they would talk softly about whatever came to mind and then roll into their sleeping bags and that later they'd wake up and it would be morning and there would not be a boy, um, war, sorry, and that Billy Boy Watkins had not died of a heart attack that afternoon. He pretended he was not a soldier. So when we're talking about this character whose name is, you find it first, Paul Berlin. If you had to say something about Paul Berlin, what would you say? He's pretending he's not a soldier. In the morning, when they reached the sea, it would be better. The hot afternoon would be over, he would bathe in the sea, and he would forget how frightened he had been on his first day at war. The second would not be so bad. He would learn, oh my gosh, it's his first day of war. Must be terrified. There was a sound beside him and a movement and then a breathed hay. He opened his eyes, shivering as if emerging from a deep nightmare. Hey, a shadow whispered, we're moving, get up. Okay, you sleeping or something? No, he, he could not make out the soldier's face. With clumsy concrete hands, he clawed for his rifle, found it, found his helmet. The, so the shadow soldier grunted, you got a lot to learn, buddy. I'd shoot you if I thought you was sleeping. Let's go. Notice here it wants you to go over to the analyze. What makes the dialogue sound like a real conversation? How does the author write it so that it sounds like it's actual people talking and not just some dude writing a book? Ahead of him, silhouetted against the sky, he saw the string of soldiers wading into the flat paddy. The black outline of their shoulders and packs and weapons, he was comfortable. He did not want to move, but he was afraid for it was his first night at the war. So he hurried to catch up, stumbling once, scraping his knee, groping as though blind. His boots sank into the thick paddy water and he smelled it all around him. He would tell his mother how it smelled, mud and algae and manure. Manure is poop, right? Um, uh, chlorophyll, decay, uh, breeding mosquitoes, ew, and leeches as big as mice. The fecund warmth of the paddy waters rising up to his cut knee, 
but he could not tell how frightened he had been. If you look at this, it wants you to go over. In this boxed passage, does O'Brien use long sentences, short sentences, or both? Look at the sentences. If you need to go through and count periods, do that if it'll make you feel better. And then answer the question. Once they reached the sea, things would be better. They would have their rear guarded by 3,000 miles of ocean, and they would swim and dive in the breakers and hunt crayfish and smell the salt, and they would be safe. Do you think that Paul Berlin is being realistic about the war? Do you think once they reach to the sea that everything is going to be safe and better? That seems to be his concern. He followed the shadow of the man in front of him. It was a clear night. Already the Southern Cross was out, which is a group of stars. And other stars he could not yet name. Soon, he thought, he would learn their names. And puffy night clouds. There was not yet a moon. Wading through the paddy, his boots made sleepy sloshing sounds like a lullaby. And he tried not to think. That's a very nice image. They made sleepy sloshing sounds like a lullaby. Though he was afraid, he knew that fear came in many degrees and types and peculiar categories. And he knew that his fear now was not so bad as it had been in the afternoon when poor Billy Boy Watkins got killed by a heart attack. We're talking about fear again, right? So he's talking about how fear comes in different types. His fear now was diffuse and unformed. Ghosts in the tree line, nighttime fears of a child, a boogeyman, a boogeyman in the closet that his father would open to show him um, empty, saying, See? Nothing there, champ. Now you can sleep. Diffuse means be unfocused, so his fear is unfocused. He doesn't exactly know what he's fearing. He just knows there's a lot to fear. They're kind of like ghosts or boogeyman. They just appear. In the afternoon, it had been worse. The fear had been bundled and tight, and he'd been on his hands and knees, crawling like an insect, an ant escaping a giant's footsteps. Have you noticed that O'Brien really likes similes? And thinking nothing, brain flopping like wet cement in a mixer, not thinking at all, watching while Billy Boy Watkins died. Now as he stepped out of the paddy onto a narrow dirt path, now the fear was mostly the fear of being so terribly afraid again. He's afraid of being afraid. So he tried not to think. There were tricks he'd learned um, to keep him from thinking, counting. He counted his steps, concentrating on the numbers, pretending that the steps were dollar bills and that each step through the night made him richer and richer so that soon he would become a wealthy man. And he kept counting and considered the ways he might spend the money after the war and what he would do. Remember earlier they said that he was pretending and now he's using his um, imagination. Basically, he wants to be anywhere but where he is. He would look his father in the eye and shrug and say, it was pretty bad at first, but I learned a lot and I got used to it. And then he would tell his father the story of Billy Boy Watkins, but he would never let on how frightened he had been. Not so bad, he would stay and said, making his father feel proud. Songs, another trick to stop him from thinking. Where have you gone, Billy, 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 Billy boy? And where have you gone, charming Billy? I've got to seek a wife. She's the joy of my life, but she's a young thing and can't not leave her mother. And other songs that he sang in his thoughts as he walked towards the sea. And when he reached the sea, he would dig a deep hole in the sand and he would sleep like the high clouds and he would not be afraid anymore. It's time to pause and reflect. Why does Paul count his steps and sing songs in his mind when he walks? And based on Paul's thoughts so far, what can you infer about the relationship with his father? Did he have a positive relationship? Did he have a negative relationship? Uh, was he his teacher? Was he his um, abuser? I don't know. You tell me. Focus. Read on to find uh, out more about how Paul deals with his fears. As you continue to work through the story, pay attention to the words the author uses to describe Private Berlin's thoughts. The moon came out, pale and shrunken to the size of a dime. The army was, I'm sorry, the helmet was heavy on his head. In the morning, he would adjust the leather binding. He would clean his rifle too. 
Even though he had been frightened to shoot it during the hot afternoon, he would carefully clean the breech and muzzle and the ammunition so that the next time he would be ready and not so afraid. In the morning, when they reached the sea, he would begin to make friends with some of the other soldiers. He would learn their names and laugh at their jokes. Then, when the war was over, he would have war buddies, and he would write to them once in a while and exchange memories. It seems kind of strange to me that he's going to the war to meet friends, but I don't know. What do you think? Walking, sleeping in his walking, he felt better. He watched the moon come higher. Once they skirted a sleeping village, the smells again, straw, cattle, mildew, the men were quiet. On the far side of the village, buried in the dark smells, a dog barked. The column stopped until the barking died away, and then they marched fast away from the village, through a graveyard filled with conical-shaped burial mounds and tiny altars made of clay and stone. This section here is interesting. We're learning a little bit about the people of Vietnam, right? That their graveyard has conical shapes. You know, that means a cone. Uh, burial mounds. It's also um, interesting that the dog barks and the men all stop. So the dog must have heard something, right? Um, so that's going to be this question. The mounds would make fine battlements and the smell was nice and the place was quiet. So the place that he likes the most right now is the graveyard. But they went on, passing through a hedgerow and across another paddy and east towards the sea. He walked carefully. He remembered what he'd been taught, stay off the center of the path, for that was where the landmines and booby traps were planted, uh, where stupid and lazy soldiers like to walk. Stay alert, he'd been taught, better alert than inert. <laughs> Funny, right? Mm. I guess, yeah. agile, mobile, hostile. He wished he'd been paid, uh, he'd paid better attention to the training. He could not remember what they'd said about how to stop being afraid. They had been, they hadn't been given any lessons in courage, not that he could remember. And they hadn't mentioned how Billy Boy Watkins would die of a heart attack, his face turning pale and the, the veins popping out. Private first class Paul Berlin walked carefully, stretched ahead of him, the shadow soldiers, whose names he did not know yet, moved with the silence um, and slow grace of smoke. Now and again, moonlight was reflecting off of a machine gun or a wristwatch, but mostly the soldiers were quiet and hidden and far away in a seeming peaceful night, strangers on a long street, and he felt quite separate from them, as if trailing behind like the caboose on a night train, pulled along by inertia, sleepwalking, an afterthought of the war. This would be a good section for you to think about Paul Berlin's thoughts. He feels like he's not even in control. He's being pulled along. He's sleepwalking. So he walked carefully, counting his steps. While he had counted to 3,485, the column stopped. One by one, the soldiers knelt or squatted down. The grass along the path was wet, and Private First Class Paul Berlin lay back and turned his head so that he could lick at the dew with his eyes closed, another trick uh, to forget the war. He might have slept. I wasn't afraid he was screaming or dreaming, facing his father's stern eyes. I wasn't afraid, he was saying. When he opened his eyes, a soldier was sitting be beside him, quietly chewing a stick of double mint gum. You sleeping again, the soldier whispered. No, said Private First Class Paul Berlin. The soldier grunted, chewing his gum. Then he twisted the cap off his canteen, took a swallow, and handed it through the dark. Take some, he whispered. Thanks. You're the new guy? Yes. He didn't want to admit it, being new to the war. The soldier grunted and handed him a stick of gum. Chew it quiet, okay? Don't blow bubbles or nothing. This is great advice for in class, bossy. Thanks, I won't. He could not make out the man's face in the shadows. They sat still, and Private First Class Paul Berlin chewed the gum until all the sugars were gone, and then the soldier said, Bad day today, buddy. Private First Class Paul Berlin nodded wisely, but he did not speak. Don't think it's always so bad, the soldier whispered. I, I don't want to scare you. You'll get used to it soon enough. They've been fighting wars a long time, and you get used to it. Yeah, you will. They were quiet a while and the night was quiet, no crickets or birds, and it was hard to imagine it was truly a war. 
He searched for the soldier's face, but he could not find it, and it did not matter much. Even if he saw the fellow's face, he would know, know the name, and even if he knew the name, it would not matter much. Haven't got the time, the soldier whispered. No, rats doesn't matter. Really, it goes faster if you don't know the time anyhow. Sure. What's your name, buddy? Paul. Nice to meet you, he said. And in the dark, besides the path, they shook hands. Mine's Toby. Everybody calls me Buffalo, though. The soldier's hand was strangely warm and soft, but it was a very big hand. Sometimes they just call me Buff, he said. What do you learn about Private Berlin and Buffalo from their dialogue? So you're looking at the dialogue here, and we do find a couple of things out about both of these characters. What do we find out? And they were quiet again. They lay in the grass and waited. The moon was very high now and very bright, and they were waiting for cloud cover. Pause and reflect right here. Read lines 135 to 170 and underline words that help you picture the soldier known as Buffalo. And then the question wants to know is that how is uh, Buffalo different from our main character, Paul Berlin? The soldier suddenly snorted. What is it? Nothing, he said, but then he snorted again. A bloody heart attack, the soldier said. Can't get over it. Old Billy boy croaking from a lousy heart attack. A heart attack. Can you believe it? The idea of it made Private First Class Berlin smile. He couldn't help it. Ever hear such a thing? Not till now, said Private First Class Paul Berlin, er, uh, sm still smiling. You notice the author repeats his rank and his full name. I wonder why he does that. Me neither, said the soldier in the dark, dying of a heart attack. Didn't know him yet, did you? Nope. Tough as nails, yeah? And what happens? A heart attack. Can you imagine it? Yes, said Private First Class Paul Berlin. He wanted to laugh. I, I can imagine it. And he imagined it clearly. He giggled. He couldn't help it. He imagined Billy's father opening the telegram. Sorry to inform you that your son Billy Boy was yesterday scared to death uh, in action um, in the Republic of Vietnam valiantly succumbing to a heart attack suffered while under enormous stress and it's with greatest sympathy that and he giggled again he rolled onto his belly and pressed his face into his arms his body was shaking with giggles so he's talking about a telegram home to a soldier who's dead and he can't stop laughing about it what is he laughing about Okay, so then now why is he laughing about that? Pretty strange, right? The big soldier hissed at him to shut up, but he could not stop giggling. And he remembered the hot afternoon uh, and poor Billy Boy and how they'd been drinking Coca-Cola from bright red aluminum cans and how they started on the day's march and how a little while later, poor Billy Boy stepped on the mine. Stepped on the mine. And how it made a tiny little sound. Poof and how Billy Boy stood there with his mouth wide open, looking down at where his foot had been blown off. And how finally Billy Boy sat down very casually, not saying a word with his foot lying behind him, most of it still in the boot. He giggled louder, he could not stop. He bit his arm trying to stifle it, but remembering war's over Billy, the men had said in consolation. But Billy Boy got scared and started crying and said he was about to die. Nonsense, the medic said, Doc Perret. But Billy Boy kept bawling, tightening up, his face going pale and transparent and his veins popping out. Scared stiff, even when Doc Perret stuck him uh, with the morphine, Billy Boy kept crying. So Billy Boy stepped on a mine and his foot was blown off. But the doc is saying that, you know, the war is over and that he's fine. So basically, he doesn't have to die from losing his foot. A lot of soldiers did that, but he does get to go home. But for some reason, Billy Boy cannot calm himself down. Shut up, the big soldier hissed, but Private First Class Paul Berlin could not, not stop giggling and remembering. He covered his mouth, his eyes stung, remembering how it was when Billy Boy died of fright. Shut up but he could not stop giggling the same way Billy Boy could not stop bawling afterwards. Think about Paul's response to the horror of Billy Boy's death. Do you think that the response is realistic? So do you believe that somebody after seeing their uh, fellow soldier's foot blown off 
uh, would respond by madly giggling. Side note, because you know Miss Millen likes tangents, you should watch Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Not only is it an awesome movie, but one of the things is that the bad guy's henchmen have a tendency to giggle. And at one point he says, Stop that laughing! One of these days you're gonna die laughing! I hope you liked that voice. But it kind of goes along with this. And once again, awesome movie. Afterward, Doc Perret had explained, you see, Billy Boy really died of a heart attack. He was scared he was gonna die. So scared, he had himself a heart attack. And that's what really killed him. I've seen it before. So they wrapped Billy in plastic uh, poncho, his eyes still wide and scared stiff, and they carried him over to the meadow to a rice paddy. And then when the Medvac helicopter arrived, they carried him through the paddy and put him aboard, and the mortar rounds were falling everywhere, and the helicopter pulled up and Billy Boy came tumbling out, falling fast, slowly and then faster, and the paddy water sprayed up as if Billy Boy had just executed a long and dangerous drop dive as if trying to escape a uh, graves reservation or registration where he would be tagged and sent home under a flag dead of a heart attack. So what does the word executed mean in line 230? I wonder. So Billy Boy just executed a long and dangerous dive. I can tell you right here that it does not mean put to death. So try to figure that out. Shut up, the soldier hissed. But Paul Berlin could not stop giggling, remembering scared to death. Later, they waited in after him, probably for Billy Boy with their rifle, uh, probing for Billy Boy with their rifle, uh, elegantly and delicately probing for Billy Boy in the stinking paddy, singing some, uh, some of them. Where have you gone, Billy Boy, Billy Boy? Oh, where have you gone, charming Billy? Then they found him green and covered in algae, his eyes still wide open and scarce stiff, dead of a heart attack suffered while, shut up, the soldier said, loudly shaking him. Why do you think they went back for Billy's body? It was in a rice paddy. They had to like chudge through the muck and look for him with the butts of their rifles. Why go back? And if you died in war, would you expect people to go back for you? But Private First Class Paul Berlin could not stop. The giggles were caught in his throat, drowning him in his own laughter, scared to death like Billy Boy. Giggling, lying on his back, he saw the moon move, or the clouds moving across the moon. Wounded in action, dead of fright, a fine war story. He would tell it to his father, how Billy Boy had been scared to death, never letting on. He could not stop. The soldiers smothered him. He tried to fight back, but he was weak from giggles. The moon was under the clouds and the column was moving. The soldier helped him up. You okay now, buddy? Sure. What was so bloody funny? Nothing. You can get killed laughing that way. I know, I know that. You gotta stay calm, buddy. The soldier handed him his rifle. Half the battle, just staying calm. You'll get better at it. Come on now. He turned away and Private First Class Paul Berlin hurried after him. He was still shivering. He would do better once he were reached the sea, he thought, still smiling a little. A funny war story that he would tell to his father, how Billy Boy Watkins was scared to death. A good joke. But when he smelled the salt and heard the sea, he could not stop being afraid. Then look at our two side questions. In what way is Billy Boy's crying similar to Paul's laughter? And think back to the chart from the very first section. How does Paul try to combat his fear in this story? In your opinion, is he successful? And then you have to explain why or why not. Did he do a good job of combating his fear? So right now you're going to go on to Google Classroom and you are, sorry, my pen died. You're going to take the quiz on Charming Billy. I also think that you should go back through the story and find some really good parts that help you to explain the mood. That also means that you have to come up with what is the mood. Once you've done that, you can flip to the page that has the writing. Remember, you're ignoring this prompt entirely, and you are writing a Thames paragraph about the mood of the story. 
If you are struggling to remember the structure of a Thames paragraph, go back into your old work. You can look at the Cask of Amontillado um, paragraphs, for example, to help you out. And you also do not have to do this section.